Robert, and I'm an engineer from Facebook. And today I'm going to talk about some of the work we've been doing uh, specifically in the data center to kind of evolve the data center networking stack uh, per our needs. Um, you can imagine a data center, a company like Facebook has a lot of different applications. Uh, primarily we use TCP, so we're interested in optimizing TCP. We have a lot of different hardware. Um, as you probably know, Facebook is, is really into commodity-based hardware, <clears throat> SCP servers, things like that. So I work in the kind of the kernel networking team, and we're looking kind of across the stack. And our goal is, um, as I mentioned, we want to build a network stack for the data center, and it needs to be forward-looking, meaning we want to meet uh, future requirements in terms of scalability, number of applications, what have you. So the requirements for this, uh, performance is always going to be uh, near the top, but we need scalability. Security is becoming uh, more and more paramount, especially within the data center. Programmability, obviously we, we've talked a lot about that uh, so far in the conference. Uh, this is something that we are integrating in various layers, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, reliability, availability. Uh, a whole bunch of uh, characteristics like that. Um, data centers need a lot of uptime, and we obviously like to have uh, systems running without having to muck with them too much. I would point out that this is obviously not something that ever, ever ends. As long as we have data centers, we're going to be looking at ways to improve them, evolve them, different technologies, uh, even different protocols at some point. So. We are kind of addressing this um, from a holistic point of view. So from the applications all the way down to the NICs and the drivers. And I think one of the, the big events or, or big additions to data center networking stacks really are security and virtualization. They are now becoming commonplace to the point I think we need to kind of modify the um, networking stack model that we have. And as I mentioned, programmability is important. This is not really specific to any layer. It turns out that we're finding programmability of the networking stack almost at every, every single layer. So we obviously have a lot of instances where we want to program the NIC with certain things, drivers like XDP. Uh, but this even percolates all the way up to sockets and, and some other things. So this is kind of the modified view of the stack layer, um, or the network stack on the right. So you can see we have a modified view of kind of sockets, and uh, security becomes part of this. Um, ILA is going to be our network virtualization solution. IPv6 is extremely critical. Um, Facebook was one of the first companies uh, to, use, to move to an IPv6-only data center. Uh, and then we have drivers and offloads. So at each of these layers, we have uh, specific technologies we're looking at. And I'll touch a little bit on um, each of these. So at the API layer, we invented this thing called Kernel Connection Multiplexer. Uh, Dave Watson actually talked a little bit about it yesterday. The motivation for this really is the fact that in the data center, nearly all of our communications are some sort of RPC or message-based communication. And since we're doing this over TCP, this turns out to be a little bit of a mismatch. So TCP is a stream-based protocol, yet we're almost always using some sort of datagram application layer protocol over it. Historically, this requires a lot of um, complexity in user space to deal with this, especially in a multi-threaded application where we might be sharing a TCP connection amongst threads we have to guarantee atomicity when we send messages and receive messages. So often that would mean if we want an, a thread to send on a TCP socket, for instance, it needs to obtain a lock in user space on that socket, send uh, data, it might get blocked on the socket and have to wait or something like that, but take some time, send the data, once it's done sending, release the lock and continue. So that in, in um, it shows a lot of locking user space. There's an equivalent receive uh, side problem. Also, as Dave mentioned, uh, polling and, and things like that all have to take this into account. So you wind up with a fairly complex layer in applications to deal with this kind of stream uh, to datagram mismatch. So what we did with KCM 
is provide a new kind of kernel socket that actually orchestrates this kind of message over, over a stream inside the kernel. And as I mentioned, it's a new socket type. We can read write messages atomically on a KCM socket. And the receive side does require that the kernel parses application layer messages. And this is where we actually introduce BPF in, in programmability into KCM. So the idea is when a packet comes in, we have a parser, uh, now it's called stream parser, which is a, a functionality we added to do this. But what it does is it parses packets as they come in. And the only thing we need out of this really is to know where the message boundaries are. So we can figure out here's a message, here's a message, here's a message, and then we can uh, treat those separately. So all of this uh, is built on a multiplexer. And it's an N by M multiplexer. So at the top, we have a number of um, sockets, uh, KCM sockets, and on the bottom we have a number of TCP connections uh, that can be, be attached. I'll get back to the slide in a minute, but uh, I did want to mention the, the stream parser. This was one of the things we added fairly recently. And as I mentioned, the idea of the stream parser is to parse the TCP stream and individual messages and deliver those to kind of the upper layer. And this is based on a few callbacks. So one of the callbacks is just a simply a callback to parse a message. In the case of KCM, this turns into a BPF program. In the case of KTLS, which is the other user, this just goes into a, a function that parses the stream as a, as a TLS message. And once the stream parser has a message, it calls a receive message. So it marshals the message together, passes the SK buff up, and gives the message. One of the bigger issues, though, is what to deal with parsing failures, what happens um, if we exceed the possible length, or the connection times out, or things like this. So we have to incorporate a fair amount of complexity into dealing with parsing failures. Now, one of the important things we did, and this was actually based on some of the feedback we had from KCM, how do you limit the amount of memory that's being consumed by this message reassembly? So these messages, messages in theory, could be arbitrarily sized length. Um, so some protocols have actually a U32 as a message size. So conceptually, they, they, they could have a four gigabyte message. Now, in reality, most protocols are kind of sane, and, and usually we see about one megabyte messages, maybe a little more. So what we did to limit the message size is we just set a, set a rule that the message has to be less than or equal to the socket buffer size. So if you can imagine, um, you can really see it in this picture, at the bottom, each TCP socket is associated with a stream parser. So the TCP sockets uh, behave as normal. Packets come in, they're put onto the TCP socket. What we do in the stream parser is we collect the SK bus off the TCP socket into normal size messages. So the maximum amount of data that can be consumed uh, in this model with that limit I mentioned is really the stream parser can have one message up to the socket buffer size, and then TCP could have an equivalent amount in its receive queue. So it's basically 2x, so that uh, forms the first limit. Now the other thing we noticed is that when we're reassembling or assembling these messages, it's quite possible that the sending application may just stop sending part of a message. So we could have the first 900k of a message and be waiting for the last 100k indefinitely. So to solve that problem, we just added a simple timer, which basically says after n milliseconds, if you don't have a full um, message, declare uh, failure and bug out. Failures are usually pretty straightforward. We just detach the TCP connection, close the TCP socket, and if the application wants to recover, it can just create a new socket. So there's not a lot of fanciness. But the important thing is that we, we do try to detect failures um, and report them so everything's maintained consistent. We don't try to do a lot of uh, recovery or if we lose synchronization, there's, there's not a lot of effort to, to recover from that. So that kind of leads us into KTLS. Um, Dave gave a lot of description about this yesterday, so I won't go too much into this. 
Um, the important points for, for this talk is this is integrated into, into the layers of the stack. So, for example, we have the, the KCM plus KTLS, or KTLS could be used independently. Um, so, uh, Dave mentioned the KCM plus KTLS, and this is actually accomplished by hooking together three sockets in a sense. And so today you mentioned this, had this picture up yesterday. I wanted to go into a little more detail. So if you look at the left side, the TLS and user space, this is the traditional uh, data path. So application goes through an open SSL library and then sends TLS on a, on a normal TCP socket. In the middle, we have the, or in the second uh, row, the KTLS. That's the first instantiation of, of KTLS. So we have the TLS socket over both a stream parser and TCP socket. So on send, the um, TLS socket just sends directly on the TCP socket, essentially. Uh, I believe it does go through the stream parser for, for some uh, marshalling. But definitely on receive, we use the stream parser to do the message boundary delineation uh, that collects the messages up. So again, that has one limitation, which is uh, the size of the socket buffer, and then TCP socket has a socket buffer, and then TLS has a socket buffer, so now we can do the, do the math and figure out the uh, amount of memory that can be queued uh, in that. There is um, one kind of caveat in KTLS that um, we haven't resolved yet. When we get a, a large message, say um, a GRO message, could be up to 64K, that could actually contain a multiple number of application layer messages. And when we do the um, message, uh, me message delineation on that, what we do is we clone an SK buff for each of these messages. And that works great. <clears throat> so now if we have a 64K message, we, we might have, say, 1,000 messages, 1,064 byte messages in that. <clears throat> so we get 1,000 SK buffs, and we can deal with that. Uh, the problem that, that Dave found out was that true size is not changed when we clone. So when we actually enqueue these messages onto a socket buffer, if we're measuring by true size, it looks like we have 1,000 times 64K of data. So that's kind of interesting. Um, we, we need to figure out a way to this because the, the memory that appears to be consumed is nowhere near the actual memory. And one of the open issues we have with KTLS. So on the right, though, we have the full KTLS plus KCM. So um, from the application point of view, this is going through a KTLS socket, and then have one stream parser, uh, which is for the TLS socket. So that's the part that takes the unencrypted data, does the stream parser on it, and delivers it to T uh, KCM on the receive side. And then Below that, we have the TLS socket, which does the same thing, um, basically decrypts the TLS as it comes in and gives that to KCM and gives that to user space. So one of the things that kind of was blocking KCM for us was obviously that we needed to move crypto into the kernel to be able to do this. And th this works great. Um, it does have some, some disadvantages in some sense in, in that we have to have the full crypto path in the kernel. It also is kind of low, which means um, an application doing a write from user space, we can't really encrypt at that point. The encryption happens later. So Dave's idea, for instance, of doing the copy plus crypto really wouldn't apply here since it's separate. However, the, the advantage, obviously, of having all of this in the kernel is that middle box where we can do splice. Now we can, um, as, as Dave pointed out, get the advantages of splice with, with crypto, now splice over KCM all in the kernel. So that has a, a pretty big advantage. OK, so moving on to the TCP layer. Uh, Larry Brackmo, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, put a lot of effort into data center TCP implementation. Uh, the basic idea of data center TCP is to extract information uh, from an ECN mark in the IP header. Uh, the ECN mark is set by routers when they're kind of approaching their, their full queue. Uh, 
And the idea is when we receive an ECN mark, we can back off on our TCP connection. So it's really an active signal from the network um, that we're getting queue built up. So we found that with this, we can achieve um, full link utilization. So we have, we have some nice uh, results from that. There are some interesting consequences, especially when we have communications uh, between data centers and different congestion control algorithms. So uh, Larry actually implemented a few nice optimizations for this. Um, one of the things though, and, and I know this idea keeps popping in and out, is when we introduce a new congestion control algorithm, do we want to have separate network queues uh, to eliminate the interference between uh, different algorithms? So we've seen this a lot. Um, ten, I, I tend to think this is kind of punning. I would rather have uh, congestion control algorithms that actually work uh, in concert with others, but uh, for practical reasons, we may have to occasionally do stuff like that, so even though it's left preferable. So the results of uh, the data center TCP are, are generally pretty good. Uh, in this graph, graph you can see the green uh, line bar indicates the throughput. Uh, we're definitely doing better than cubic as flows increase, and with Reno, uh, it's definitely competitive. The more interesting part, though, are the white dashes and the red dashes. So the red dashes indicate 50% latency, and the scale is on the right side, or the white dashes indicate 50% latency. The red diamonds indicate the 99.9% .9 latency, um, which to a large extent is, is the most interesting latency. Usually in the data center, we're interested in the tail as opposed to the, as opposed to the medium. So if you look, though, um, one of the important attributes of data center TCP is that the red diamond is close to the white dash, meaning our worst case latency is very close to the median case latency. This is actually a very good property. So for instance, if you look at the far left uh, for that example on Reno with one flow, the median latency is great, but that 99.9% .9 latency is, is just off the scale. So what we're looking for really is how do you <clears throat> How do you pull that tail latency at 99.9% .9 latency? How do you pull that closer to the median latency? So you can see that we're getting that effect out of data center TCP um, pretty much through all the flows. <clears throat> so moving uh, down to the next layer. So identifier, locator, addressing. This is basically our um, solution to network virtualization at Facebook. And the idea is we're going to split the IPv6 address into two components. The high order bits, 64 bits, are uh, the locator. Low order 64 bits are an identifier. Locator basically says where uh, the packet goes. Identifier says who. So you can think in terms of network virtualization, the identifier, locator is a physical address. Identifier is virtual address. So in this model applications, what they see is sort of a, a globally visible address. Uh, they can get this out of DNS. But when they send, at some point, we need to convert that address into an actual kind of physical address. So we do a translation on the upper 64 bits from this global, what we're calling SUR address, into a locator. So the sending process um, is pretty straightforward. We look up the identifier in, in a table. If that returns a structure that gives us the locator to, to write in, we did one kind of nice optimization based on, uh, I believe it was a six to four uh, RFC from Cisco. That is to do a checksum neutral translation. So when we change the IP addresses, and this is technically a forum net, but when we change the IP addresses, that can mess up the checksum, uh, transport checksum that's using the IP ad addresses in the pseudo header. So instead of going in and trying to find that transport layer checksum, what we do is we modify the IP header or IP addresses in such a way to compensate for that. So we actually use the low order 16 bits of the destination IP address to do this uh, nice trick of modifying uh, um, a straightforward modification, one on modification, modify that, and then the checksum uh, is the same as we send the packet. So this is kind of the uh, example of it. And if you can imagine, we have a source sending to the 
virtual address of quad three one at the left. And we have the ability to actually um, cache mappings at the host. So what, what, the way we're going to deploy this is the first time we send a packet, we won't know, the host won't know where this packet is actually going. So we'll send the packet out into the network, untranslate it. That will hit what we're calling the ILA router. And the ILA router's job is to basically receive these sort of untranslated packets and translate them and forward on to the, the destination. So it's a lot like a NAT box. Um, so step one, we send the packet, hits the router, do the translation to a quad two, uh, colon one, colon, colon one, which is now the physical address. Send the packet on to the locator. At the destination host, it does the reverse translation. So it'll replace the quad two, colon one, colon, colon one, with the quad three, colon, colon one, and that is what the application sees. So the application never actually sees the locator addresses. It just sees the kind of virtual addresses. Now, in addition to forwarding the uh, untranslated ILA packets, uh, a router can also send back a type of redirect. And this would basically be telling the, the sending host, by the way, you don't have to send to me anymore. Here's the actual locator. Use this from now on, and we eliminate the triangular routing. So there is some, some discussion about this. Um, this looks a lot like an ICMP redirect, but ICMP redirects are notoriously insecure. So uh, we can only do, the, only do the redirect if we solve the security problem. We also have another proposal, which um, actually I sent some patches recently to do an ILA resolver, in which case the host, before it sends, or well, the host, when it sends, can actually send a resolve request saying, here's the SIR address, the globally visible address, can you tell me what the locator is for that? So it would send this and it would hit uh, basically a resolver and the resolver ret return that. So it's another way to eliminate the triangular routing. So one step below that, um, we have IPv6. As I mentioned, Facebook is um, heavily invested in IPv6 in the data center. And this does solve one obvious problem. Uh, in a large data center, we historically tended to use 10 slash 8 addresses. 10 slash 8 theoretically gives you 16 million addresses. Uh, as far as I know, no known data center has nearly that, <clears throat> that many hosts. But the problem is in how we allocate and do hierarchical allocation of these address spaces. So it is actually possible to run out of a 10 slash 8 space because I need to give racks of, say, 48 machines, uh, 64 host address, or, or something like that. So instead of continuously renumbering, um, which a lot of companies have been doing, or, or try to, to conserve address space, um, some of the guys at Facebook at one point just said, let's just go and make it IPv6. And it ends up being the kind of thing uh, in order to do this at a large scale, you really need somebody dedicated to this. In, in this case, it was Paul Saab. Um, just went hog wild to, to find every application, deal with uh, providers, things like that. And voila, two years later, an all IPv6 network. Um, it is a one-way ticket. I don't think we can ever go back to IPv4. So, I mean, it's, it's well invested. But that being said, um, we do get a lot of benefits out of IPv6. Uh, the addressing flexibility is really amazing. We can do things like assign every single host its own slash 64, which means we have two to the 64th objects we can address in every host. So that easily gets us the idea of um, one address per task, but I think we're going to go way beyond that and have individual um, pieces of content eventually will have their own IP address. So there's a lot of, of cool stuff we can do there. One of the other um, interesting features of IPv6, which is actually kind of subtle, and I think hasn't really been used to its fullest extent, is the flow label. So we talk a lot about ECMP. We talk a lot about um, using UDP encapsulation and things like that. All of these have this property that uh, before IPv6 and before flow label, devices had to actually parse into transport layers in order to get port layer information in order to do L4, layer 4 ECMP. It turns out if we use the flow label correctly, all of that goes away. We can now do layer 4 ECMP, layer 4 hashing, just based on the IP header. 
And this, this really is a huge win. Um, I, I, it, it's subtle in a sense, and it took us a while to actually get to the point where we're even setting floor labels on the internet. Um, but I'm hoping that vendors pick this up, and, and once we get to really an all IPv6 world, this is the first step where vendors can stop doing DPI just for the purposes of getting transport uh, ports. So I think it's actually a, a little thing that's going to have a big impact eventually. One of the other interesting things, though, is extension headers. This is a little more checkered on whether or not we'll ever get full use out of this. Um, the idea of extension headers, of course, is to extend IP, which requires adding uh, bits to headers. And this is where, again, the, the vendors have a say because they historically want to parse into packets to get the transport layer. Putting in extension headers kind of messes them up. And this is a vendor problem, but we kind of have to deal with this, and it does limit us to when and where we can use extension headers. I'm kind of optimistic, though, uh, specifically because of segment routing. That may actually kind of um, finally give us a reason to use extension headers and maybe force um, specifically the router vendors to actually use this and start uh, parsing this correctly. Uh, moving down to kind of lower layers, so we have NIC offloads. Um, I think a lot of this has already been talked about. Um, definitely less is, less is more is critical to us. And more generic, the better. Uh, from a data center point of view, we have a lot of different hardware from different vendors. Uh, sometimes least common denominator does drive our, our design. So there is some element of that. Uh, programmable devices, these are kind of exciting uh, to think about, um, especially I think we mentioned the GRO or LRO. LRO has historically been very difficult. Um, the black box nature of it, uh, the inconsistencies between hardware implementations. If we have the opportunity to implement our own LRO, run it on different devices, but have exactly the same behavior, that, that's interesting. That could actually be a segue into some more impressive types of programmability. So this is kind of important, and I think this is a, an opportunity to maybe move the needle on, on offloads. I think we've kind of been stuck um, for a long time, as I mentioned yesterday. There, there's five basic offloads, and four of those we, we've kind of deployed, and I think um, Alex's work and, and others are kind of getting as much as we can out of those. So the, the question is in the future, how do we move forward? How can we extend the concept of offloads, um, which probably include parsing inside uh, various forms of hardware? So programmability, as I mentioned, this kind of spans all the different layers. Um, we're obviously very interested in BPF. That seems to be um, kind of getting traction as, as the way to, to arbitrarily program uh, the devices in the stack. Uh, we see some great examples of this. So SRU reuse port, uh, I thought that was quite innovative, um, making decisions based on not just a simple hash or anything even fixed. But now we can program as a reuse port to do kind of creative, um, arbitrary managing of, of, of steer, or packet steering, I guess, is what it would be. Uh, integrated in TC, uh, XDP, we've talked a lot about that, uh, works well, sockets, et cetera. Uh, KCM was actually another use case of that. One of the big advantages of BPF really was when the LLVM and Clang support got um, the BPF extensions, so now we can write BPF programs in plain C, looks like C, uh, compiles um, as C, and that works, works great. I think this is also kind of an interesting thing. Once we've um, made this a compiler problem, now if we want to optimize BPF, it's a compiler issue. So it's no longer like we have to actually code it ourselves. It's not like writing assembly. We've moved this problem into something higher layer. So, so eventually, it's pretty inevitable. We have really large um, BPF programs. And we'll go beyond the ability of anyone to, to write the assembly for that effectively. So getting that into, into C or a compiler, and we can now optimize for this. So I think it's possible the next extension of this is if we can put something into a compiler, can we optimize for particular pieces of hardware? And one of the things I was thinking about yesterday was the, the concept of putting P4 into, um, into TC or P4 into the devices. 
this is interesting because P4 and, and BPF, in some sense, they're, they're kind of like two ends of the spectrum. They're, they're, they do equivalent things, which we're both trying to get programmability uh, in, in the hardware, at least in the case of P4. But, but the idea is somehow programmability somehow allow uh, the user to control the device and, and do different things other than what the hardware allows. So nobody's going to question that, that that's um, kind of the whole SCN model and where we're going. But it's going to be interesting to see how the, these two kind of concepts rectify. So, so P4 is uh, really designed to, to drive hardware. It it's kind of has a hardware model in mind. BPF was saying there's no hardware model, but we're kind of hoping that BPF can be adapted into different hardware models. So it's interesting, interesting to me to see where these two will intersect. Um, I think that's one of the things that we'll be looking at kind of from a higher layer as we go on. So one thing about the programmability, um, we also intend this in cases like XDP or, or hardware to be portability. So that potentially has a lot of value. And in fact, something like XDP, I would love to see that not just in Linux, but actually uh, we could do this in Windows or some other, other OSs. So a, lot of, a lot of cool things there, and I think this is like leading um, how we maybe do a lot of networking in, in the future. So BPF, uh, <clears throat> this is kind of, kind of the overview. It's, um, it's not just networking, obviously. It's being applied all over the kernel. Uh, Perth has actually seemed to be the biggest user of it now. But if you look at it from a, a kind of hierarchy point of view, we have the use cases. We allow different languages. Uh, as I mentioned, the compilers. And then within the kernel, there's various trace points. And um, kernel support has JITs, uh, things like that. So we're able to put stuff in the kernel. And then hardware, we have various forms of support for that. So this, is, this obviously is a direction in its own. I think it'll continue. But we'll continue to look at how we apply this to networking. Uh, one of the things we have to be careful about BPF is we're now applying it to the data path. So, uh, performance and, and things like that actually become, become critical. Um, always measure it um, and always uh, keep reevaluating. Seems to be a good policy. Uh, express data path, so I won't uh, go into this too much. Um, obviously, Dave gave a good intro for it uh, in the keynote. We'll also have the um, work, uh, workshop tomorrow on it, and we'll have a, a couple of presentations that give a little more detail into us. Um, but I, I think the key things, the takeaway here, XDP, uh, it's going to be programmable um, via BPF, portable, and um, it's kind of leveraging all the work we've done on BPF and just acknowledging that, that bare metal packet processing, at least, um, will get us the performance. So uh, with that, uh, any questions? Um, what happened to the new Vegas that Larry Bracknell did? Uh, what happened to what? How come Facebook is not using the new Vegas congestion control? Oh, um, that's, as you know, that, that's always an interesting question. Um, we do intend to, to do some deployment of it. Um, I, I think the, the main issue um, we have in the data center is when we, whenever we deploy a new congestion control algorithm, the question is how does that affect the existing stuff? Uh, usually it's hard to turn on a switch for all of this stuff. So it is a phased approach. TCPNV, we do see, um, I, think, I think it has a similar intent to BBR, uh, finding that, I, I, I think that was a, a term for that point, um, measure the latent or measure the RTT, find the inflection point where increasing the rate of data in the network doesn't increase the, the throughput. Um, so yes, it is still active. Uh, I think it's it's, um, it's it's evolutionary. So I don't have a, a straight answer whether or not we'll be running it next year or not. Uh, in fact, I think that's almost true for anything we're presenting here today. Um, whatever we do will be for the benefit of, of the network. Um, some things are, are becoming less negotiable. Uh, security, for instance, 
uh, more and more it's looking like we're gonna, just going to have to be secure all the time. And that becomes kind of the cost-benefit thing. And one of the reasons we want something like KTLS, for instance, is to get that cost-benefit down so security becomes an advantage. So it's always a, always a process of evaluating, evaluating where you are and what the next technologies are. So uh, a new technology like XDP is interesting because that has a lot of, of opportunity. But at the end of the day, the question is, how do you actually apply that, measure it, show uh, uh, um, improvement, especially in the data center where it's a very generic um, kind of atmosphere. For running TCP NV to the intranet, um, I think the interactions with Cubic probably are, are kind of difficult at this point. I don't know if you've seen, thought about that with VBR, but uh, at a large scale internet where we can't control much, um, these protocols become even harder. Data center, at least we have the advantage, it's kind of a closed system, so we might be able to, to do a deployment of something like TCP NV, but it would take some, some time and energy. Okay, uh, I have another question. That's uh, for the KCM sockets. Uh, do you do anything if, let's say, you know, one application writes a one byte message, but the other writes a hundred megabyte message? Mm -hmm. um, how do you do? You do anything to do this kind of hell light blocking issue? So right now, it's um, it, first of all it has an advantage in that you can do that in parallel. So if you have two KCM sockets and only one TCP connection. There's a nice effect that both of them could be writing to the KCM socket, so you can do copies in parallel, which is an advantage of having only one TCP socket. Now, in terms of fairness between the sockets, um, I don't think we've done too much on that, except uh, mostly a round robin sort of thing. Um, but obviously, we could extend that to have priority levels. Um, probably could use some sort of even a programmable uh, which which one do you send first? So there are a lot of options there. I think for the most part, though, the, the model of KCM we have initially is that it's, um, say, a, a web web backend or something like that, and we're considering all all packets to be equal importance. Uh, but there's not there's nothing to prevent um, prevent that from changing. There also is another uh, thing in, in KCM which might be an extension right now. KCM so sockets are effectively connected. So if you write to a KCM socket, that writes to um, a specific set of TCP sockets that are going to a specific destination. So all KCM sockets are currently connected. One thing we might do is actually make an unconnected mode, which is interesting because now we could have one KCM socket that can send to thousands of different destinations. Um, and we would specify in some sort of address which which destination to send on. So that might be an extension to KCM, and that could reduce the number of KCM sockets that we would need. But wouldn't that just be UDP sockets? They look like UDP sockets, but they're, they're just KCM. So um, we also use the uh, uh, that um, SOC, seek, SOC, seek packet, which is uh, like the third type of, of socket, so you have a datagram, stream, and uh, seek packet. This actually allows you to form kind of pseudo streams using datagrams. Um, and that actually is very useful too. So case, think of KCM as being UDP-like uh, in terms of application layer interface, which pretty much is what application writers want. I think that's the best way to phrase it. So you mentioned SAC packet, and when you did KCM, one of the uh, Oracle introduced maybe five, six years ago into the kernel of the RDS socket, which is also SAC packet. So what were your, uh, why you didn't use it? What, it was brought up on the mailing list and what? For the? What, why, yes, why you, couldn't you have used RDS? Um, so RDS was well, a, a, a specific type of, of protocol, right? So for, for KCM, we can use this with almost any application layer protocol. So we have an HTTP method. Uh, you could do Stubby. You can do Thrift. So we really wanted to accelerate uh, existing application layer protocols. Uh, 
And in fact, you can even imagine we could use KCM as, as a web server uh, to parse HTTP2, uh, which would be pretty straightforward. So the, but the real win of, of KCM or the enabler was actually BPF. Without BPF, what we would have had to do was put a little module that implements each of these little protocols inside the kernel. So we'd have the thrift module, um, the HTTP2 module, and that was just so unpleasant. So this was a great um, convergence of technology. It's like, oh, BPF, arbitrarily programmable, KCM. We don't want to put application layer protocols in the kernel at all. It's, it's a bad idea. But now we can in a way that the kernel doesn't know about. So it's a beautiful um, use case for, for BPF turned out to work out really great. Okay. Thank you.